Hey, Craig Morris here, and welcome to Alchemy of Donor Attraction. In this video, I'm going to show you how we can attract total strangers and carefully lead them and guide them to us for that first engagement. Uh, whether it be a, a donation right off the bat, which is great, or something like requesting more information, all the way to them setting up a call with you to talk about their giving. And that's what I love doing. And most fundraisers I've ever worked with, their mouths drop open when I tell them I get people to set up calls with me to ask me how they can give rather than the other way around. We talked last week about donor conversion, and that was how to turn a, a perfect stranger into a donor. But this week, we're going to talk about a few ways to attract unknown prospects to your cause. People who are out there and you don't know them, they don't know you, but they need you in their life. They need your organization in their life. But they just don't know it yet until you're able to get in front of them with your proof of case and spark something within them to want them to get involved with your organization. And I love this about fundraising. What we're covering in this video. Um, today I'm covering in this video one big mistake fundraisers make when trying to grow their donor base. And this is important for you to hear so you don't forge ahead thinking you're doing something great when really you're following into what's a common trap. Then I'm bringing back my science and biology background into the program. I'm going to be taking the theory of natural selection, this concept, and I'm going to be showing you how to use it to think about how to get the the best possible prospects to talk to. And this is the smart way about going about uh, getting prospects, true solid prospects, into the fold. When it comes to attracting donors, nothing's as powerful as natural selection here, okay? And I don't know anybody who thinks it, of it this way in fundraising. But when you do, and when I share it with this with people, it really clicks with them. It makes sense and makes fundraising effective and efficient for them. And I think it will for you, too. Lastly, uh, before we move on with specific methods this week, I'm going to introduce you to the organic and paid methods we're going to be talking about this week. Again, that's organic donor attraction methods. That's where you want to start especially if you're just getting started in fundraising or getting started with a reborn program or a new nonprofit particularly, uh, then paid is ideal to take things to that next level. Once you have your proof of case formed and established, I'm gonna be saying this over and over again. But before all that, let's take a look at our donor acquisition methodology. Uh, let's use this to see how far we've come in, in building this uh, and how far you've come in building yours. Last week we took the pieces you've been working on since the beginning and put them into the fourth step of this methodology. That's the engagement options. Now recall that you built through your proof of case and your conversion script last week the different options for a person to get engaged with your organization with making a donation one key critical engagement option, obviously, because ultimately all your prospects are to be donors, right? A volunteer, who, who someone who, who, who has expressed engagement and engages in volunteering and giving time, they need to become a donor. Someone who attends an event of yours, if they're a solid prospect, they need to become a donor. You know, if you're a membership organization, definitely need to be donating as well. And now you know how to begin converting all these people. This week, we're going to go over this first part here. This is the first part of this methodology here that we're building out this week, which is, of course, our two types of attraction methods, paid and organic. And we'll cover through steps two and three. Because we're attracting donors, and then we're inviting them in to engage with us, ultimately converting them right into donors. Now don't complicate this. We're focusing here and at this point what a lot of people will do is they'll start thinking about all the different ways to bring in new donors into their organization and also thinking well 
You know, I deal with donors offline too, so this landing page thing here, it's irrelevant in, in my proof of case. I don't need to present it in this way anyway, and then things will start getting murky for them, you know. And again, fundraising clarity, we're laser like here, one step at a time, we're being guided step by step. And once you go off course and start thinking about all these other things, you can eventually. I'll say once this program is done and you feel like you're you're all the way through it, have at it. Start thinking about all the other different things. You can be creative. But um, uh, if if the point of being coming through this program is to be guided in a very straight and direct way to learn about fundraising and 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 not become frazzled, if that's who you were perhaps and you and you don't want to go there again, you don't want anything all of this to become murky you want clarity here it's the whole point of this okay so I want you to know this if you get this methodology down once you perfect this five-step process of attracting and converting donors everything else is just gravy you're, you're of course going to be able to handle offline donors and you won't have to use the landing page okay to 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 engage someone you can go old school and have them submit business cards or have them sign up in a community fair using a clipboard or something, whatever. But the process is the same. Think of that clipboard or that raffle box or volunteer sign-up sheet or whatever as your landing page. Then you'll take them through these next steps regardless. Okay, so let's stick with the program. The same goes for step three, proof of case. I told you... Uh, putting together a brief video to present online is the best way to go and it is because it's online it's working for you 24 hours a day seven days a week but of course you can present your case live you can present it in person or like a local TV ad or like a PSA <laughs> you, and your published your published newsletter you know all these things but get this process down first, okay? And the way it's presented here in Fundraising Clarity. Because getting yourself set up and positioned like this, it's like having staff working for you 24 hours a day for anyone out there in the world who wants to engage with you. Because the time is right for them. This is donor-centric. You don't want to be missing out on all this great community support because you're off the clock or away from your desk and doing all these other things you have to do while someone decides right now, you know, that they're ready to become a donor or engage with you. And even more, something should happen in the world that spontaneously brings attention to your cause and suddenly you have droves of people checking you out online. That happens. You know, I said I've worked in child welfare, domestic abuse, that sort of thing. You know, when something hits the news and all of a sudden, our, you know, our cause is in the spotlight because there's been a high-profile domestic violence case or something, that's your, your, your website, your landing page. This process, your message, it's all set up, ready to go. If a million people start, you know, hit your website... One million of them, all one million of them, are going to be uh, approached in a similar way and put through this uh, sort of funnel, this process here. So you're all set up and ready to, to funnel them through this process, and bam, now all you have to worry about is week six of this program, which is stewarding all those new donors you have and, and uh, keeping them and managing your big new donor community. Wouldn't that be wonderful? All right, so let's continue building this pipeline for you. And that brings us to telling you about one big mistake fundraisers make when trying to grow their donor base. And this is more common than it should be. I often hear fundraisers talk about targeting markets and segmentation and all that, but then in practice they end up either narrowing their focus way too much or choosing to spend way too much time and money casting the widest net, and it just baffles me. So, for the sake of simplicity, they'll say, here's my prospect pool. These 100 people here are the people you're going to target. That's what I'll ask. And it could be 100, it could be 10,000. Okay, it doesn't matter. They'll tell me, basically, they're going to market to them as if 
they all have the same probability of donating. They view their prospect pool as a homogeneous collection of people and approach each of them with the same effort and attention as if they have the same likelihood of converting. And that couldn't be further from the truth. <laughs> so you personally may have been targeted in such a way before. I know I have. You get a call from someone asking for a donation and you don't know how you got on such a call list? Well, using brute force by dialing for dollars is a common tactic. And not just nonprofits, fundraising, and business uh, and sales. And there's reasons businesses do it in nonprofits because it works. <laughs> when you have a huge call center or you have the resources to outsource a call center uh, to go through a huge list, let's just say the phone book, and they need to have a huge call center with a massive workforce to call so many people because they get so many people saying no to them, right? We're, we're talking less than a 1% conversion rate. They're making 100 calls at least to get one probably small donation. And usually the rate's lower than that when you're calling random people. It's a huge waste of time. It's a huge inefficiency, and worse, 99% of, of the people or more called end up then having a poor impression of you to get a call like that. So this is a huge mistake. And here's the fact and reality we must operate on. In any given market or prospect pool, only 3% are ready right now at this moment in time. For example, even if you have a good prospect pool of 100 people and you're going to ask them all right now to make a donation, really only three are truly ready. And this presents us with a problem. If only 3% of your prospect pool is ready to give right now in this moment you're asking them, how are you able to know who they are? See, the challenge we face here is really finding out how to identify those three people without having to talk to all 100. Because if we talk to all of them, it's just not the best use of our time. Many colleagues of mine will say it's not a waste of time or it's a numbers game. A numbers game is what I hear a lot. And sure, making calls and playing the numbers games okay for some. If you have a huge call center set up and you want to keep paying people to call hundreds and thousands of people to find the proverbial needles in the haystacks, <laughs> then have at it. Don't get me wrong, okay? It's better than doing nothing uh, because big nonprofits out there who are able to make large volumes of calls or pay a firm to do it for them are still raising money, okay? D doing nothing, this is better. Calling everybody in brute force is better than doing nothing. It works. Brute force fundraising works, and that's why it exists. But this is not donor attraction. There's a much better way for the rest of us. Now, <laughs> recall this diagram. Recall the Hegelian dialectical diagram from last week. This is what we use as our feedback loop to constantly improve ourselves and our message Recall how we get feedback. So we have our current state and our desired state and why we exist in our case, which we've written out, and it's about how we're going to get from where we are to where we want to be. And we have our prospects out there and we're introducing our case here as our conversion script. And we're getting a response, uh, which is a, the synthesis, which for us we use as a tool then to improve our case and prove our case in order to get donors and donations. Uh, it's these two things. Our prospect and our case or conversion script that we're introducing to one another. We're basically introducing our conversion script as a stimulus and we're waving it in front of our prospects to get a response.
okay? And who out of, say, 100 will step forward? When we introduce this to 100 prospects and know what works to get these three, we've essentially then used natural selection to pick out the three in the herd we want. Okay, this is why establishing our proof of case is so important. Nonprofits mostly today will draft their case and run in an, uh, uh, run it through a few channels internally in their organization, and then after you know the CEO or executive director reviews it, and usually at that point all of the creativity all of the creativity is taken out of it. <laughs> it becomes some something that's that's bland and inspires less than one percent of any group of people. So use the free organic attraction methods we talk about to continue establishing and proving your case to get it where it needs to be so that you're converting. Okay, got that? So this is where we're going to talk about um, the natural selection piece, piece, and that'll make sense. This, this picture is going to make even more sense once I introduce the concept of how we're applying the theory of natural selection. Okay, we're going to apply this concept to your nonprofit. Natural selection explains how new species evolve, okay? Almost all living things have small differences between the others uh, within their own individual species. And if one of those differences allows the individual to live longer, they will likely have more offspring, that's the theory, and passing that trait on to future generations. As that trait's passed on, here the long neck of the giraffe, the giraffe, the population starts to look more like the successful individual. And that's why over time species changes, like these giraffes with their long necks, allowing them to survive. As all the food closer to the ground disappeared in their environment, that's what you hear called uh, also survival of the fittest, right? Okay. Um, and this all is very triggering for me because it reminds me of studying back in college. Back in the day in my university biology classes, we learned about these peppered moths in England in the mid-19th century. And it was, uh, in the mid-19th century actually, it was rare to see a dark or black moth. They were almost all white. Until around 1900, uh, and then they figured at that point in time, they noticed, hey, the, everything's changed. They counted and, and figured that 98% of all the moths were dark. Um, so the question was why? Well, the environment changed. See that tree there? Uh, England had experienced the Industrial Revolution, and with the proliferation of you know all these factories and burning coal, uh, and there was all this dark smoke, uh, it covered the countryside as well, not just in in the city. It covered the countryside, and the trees were were previously white uh, with lichen, uh, and they had become dark. Uh, and the camouflage white moth, the the it, the white moth used to be camouflage on these white trees. They'd become easy prey for the birds, as the trees they used to blend in with were now dark. And I always think that the most beautiful thing about this whole process is that the very first dark moths were dark and at a disadvantage because of their color, which was just a tiny problem in their DNA that made them that way. And that's the whole basis of change in our species over time. It's small mistakes, um, errors, changes in our DNA Sometimes it gives a species advantage. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. And what we're looking for when we have variation or even small, you know, what we think are mistakes in the verbiage of our case or our script, that can actually end up working to our advantage. I keep bringing that up. Um, because, uh, you know, that's where we come up with some really fascinating turns of phrase and words sometimes. Okay, here are the steps of natural selection now laid out. One, there is a variation in traits. For example, most peppered moths are white, but some are dark in color. 
two is differential reproduction. Not all individual moths get to reproduce as much as others. As here, there was a change in the environment, right? So the white moths are now getting eaten more often and not producing as much as the dark moths. Which brings us to three. The surviving dark colored moths reproduce and create more dark colored moths. And so you end up with the end result. More moths with a dark color as that's the more advantageous trait, right? So these are examples from nature. And why are we talking about this? <laughs> and how does it apply to your organization? Okay, well, some nonprofits are savvy with technology while others reject it. Since their environment changed, they're unable to compete out there and fundraise to their full potential. Okay, tech rejecting organizations simply can't serve donors as well as tech embracing nonprofits. Uh, people out there are giving much more easily to nonprofits who are at their fingertips. Everything's at your fingertips, right? So the tech rejecting nonprofits are dying out more than ever before in the current environment. The world's changed very quickly out there. And when one nonprofit has an advantage, it's the disadvantaged ones that are going to die, no matter how worthy their cause, okay? Just being a worthy cause today is not enough. I wish it were but it's not enough. Then three, there's heredity. The surviving tech-savvy organizations reproduce. It will have the surplus, and then it's going to invest in itself, and it's just going to be getting more donations, more well-paid and smart staff <laughs> who are good at what they do. And the donors you have will actually be impressed and naturally and organically share that good news with the world. And then, just like the white moths who got wiped out, the black ones uh, replaced them. The same thing's happening with the tech savvy nonprofits. And in businesses too, right? The ones that reject technology are disappearing. Think of like Blockbuster um, and um, places like that. Amazon, which took over from so many big stores. I think about the consulting firm actually. When I worked for them, uh, they're 100% virtual, right? It was, was this new model. We were all using Zoom uh, way before it blew up and was a big thing before the coronavirus pandemic. The business model for the consulting firm was to contract with fundraisers with talent all across the world, regardless of geography. So you see, it didn't matter where, where people lived or where the clients were in the world. They were able to get the best possible talent for their particular need at the time. And what happened when the environment changed, when everyone had to stay home because of the pandemic, more nonprofits needed help, actually. And this firm was ready, ready to help them because we were already set up to work remotely. And this is a great firm, and I'm proud to have interviewed and hired hundreds of people there. And think about Zoom. They were a business we we used before they were so um, popular but they were a business who naturally of course embraced technology and while at the same time skype kind of became sort of antiquated <laughs> uh, to a lot of people they were ready to adapt zoom was ready to adapt to the millions of people out there instantly needing video conferencing technology and now because of them business and nonprofits all over the world are using zoom to hold meetings online so to sum all this up it's really just survival of the fittest evolve or die this is a dodo bird here when the environment changes evolve or die right when circumstances change so do you or else this holds true for a lot of things. It's no different for us in the nonprofit sector. And as you see in these real life examples, I provided here several, it's not necessarily the strongest or the smartest that survive. It's the most adaptable. You know, in many ways, the money you raise is a reflection of a lot of things. It's not just how you're helping the world become a better place, but it's how much your donors value your mission, your cause, and how you're working it to get there. It's also how you're constantly evolving yourself. 
and your organization, not to just serve your mission, but serve your donors. The collection of people who are providing the lifeblood of your organization. So you need to constantly be evolving your skills, your mindset, which is why we work on that here in this program, in your organization, because really, nothing ever goes static in this world. So, okay, let's extend this concept now of natural selection to where we were and tie it back to fundraising and the donor attraction problem we just talked about. Recall the problem. Only 3% are ready to donate at any given time, like right now. So how do we know who they are? Okay, here's an example of how this happens in nature. How does a lion solve this problem in nature? When they're presented with 100 prospects for dinner, <laughs> buffalo, here we have a lion faced with the donor attraction problem here. And he's thinking about which are the good prospects to chase and which he should just ignore. And in fundraising, we could be looking at a large herd of donors here, okay? And they're grouped together with some characteristics that make them good prospects. But we need to know which ones to chase and which ones to ignore. Which ones are going to donate today and which ones will suck our time and potentially just get annoyed by us by calling them, you know? So do you think the lion is going to chase each of the buffalo, like one by one? Do you think we'll start with one and then try the next and then the next one, like we do at a fundraising call center, <laughs> and chase each of them with equal effort and attention, like we do at a fundraising call center? No. He'd likely expend all his energy by the time he gets to, like, number 10 or something uh, doing it that way, you know, and then go hungry and die. Uh, so, what does he do? He's smart about it. Lions in nature apply the concept of natural selection to identify the 3% that are ready now. Okay, the lion for him is spending the least amount of energy for his nutrition. And what they do, uh, what they do is they, they see a big herd like this in nature, like in this picture, and they first go out and then they agitate them, you know. Instead of chasing every single buffalo, the lion starts off slowly and is running after them. And then he scares them. He'll step, like, out in front of them to scatter them. And when he does this, he's not identified any specific buffalo to catch. He's scattering them, and, and he lets the slowest ones identify themselves. The herd of a hundred or so you know, scatters, and then there are just are two or three left behind. And that's how they're able to do this with very relatively little effort, you know, for a lion. Okay, then, when it comes to donor attraction for your nonprofit organization, how do you use natural selection to identify the 3% of your prospects ready to donate now? Okay, well, this is how we identify the 3% in nonprofit organizations, and it's a three-step process. First, know your prospect pool. Research. Research the people who are interested in your cause, okay? You've already done this. You've hypothesized who they are in week one. If you don't do your research, if the lion doesn't know what it's hunting, and it turns out he's not a lion, but a zebra preying on a pride of lions or something, <laughs> then that zebra is going to be in trouble. So anyway, we covered identifying your customer in week one, so if there's any questions about who your prospects are, go back there and do the work, please. Second, you must stimulate your prospect pool. Present a stimulus designed to appeal to their problems and their pain, that is their current state and their desired state. This is shared with your organization's case and mission. And this is how you solicit a response. And you have that and will continue to develop that in your case. All right? Then finally, once you've found someone who's the right fit, the people who are showing themselves to you, you know, that 3%, you have to get them on the phone. Once you get them to this point, you must use the conversion script and make the ask. Engage them. Got it?
OK. <laughs> we can now see these steps in our donor conversion methodology process here. While others are out there using brute force and calling everyone, we're using a fundamental force of nature in this process. And it goes like this. We have organic and paid methods, which is how we get our prospects' attention. These are our stimuli. This very first step is the lion scattering the herd. Um, you're presenting this stimulus to your prospect pool. And then is our landing page. This is where people who are stimulated by your ad or your email or whatever show up at your doorstep and they're looking for more information and they find it in step three where you provide whatever you promised in the stimulus. And this week it's going to be your case presented as a video. But it could be a case study or a webinar or something like that. But after which you, they're going to be offered engagement op options and that's what we went and that's what we went over last week in week three. These three middle steps here comprise the donor funnel. And this is how we scatter the herd, okay? This um, ends up with the 3% of the people on the phone with us. And if it's more than that, that's fantastic. You know, and then they're engaging, donating, volunteering, and so on. You're now beginning to see all of this coming together here this week. And I want to keep reintroducing things to you like these uh, models, these, these charts, these concepts, these processes, these diagrams, so that each week and with each video, uh, it, you're feeding all of this into your new program, your fundraising program, that will run smoothly and efficiently and without the huge need for a staff or a telemarketing firm or something like that to get you going. All right, so now that you understand the logic behind donor attraction here in Fundraising Clarity, let's take a look at the different methods we use to deliver your stimulus. Um, the stimulus that invokes a response from your prospect pool. And I want you to take note here with what I said. These methods are not the stimulus in themselves. The attraction methods we use are just vehicles to deliver your message. Your message is the stimulus when it comes to evoking a response. Therefore, it must strike a nerve. I'm going to show you attraction methods, that is, the vehicles through which to deliver your message. And you can learn all these and become the master of setting these things up. But if your message doesn't spark with people, then you can spend a million dollars on ads. And a shiny new website and glossy materials and television ads and nobody will care. <laughs> Compare it to natural selection. Instead of a lion, imagine you have a like a fluffy rabbit or no. Imagine you have a little field mouse run out into a pack of buffalo and it's squeaking and making the loudest noise it possibly can to startle the buffalo. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And that's the kind of messages I see come out of too many nonprofits, especially after they've been forced to go through a review process by people not trained in marketing or messaging. They get all the stuff that's thought provoking stripped away and a lot of words added in it that then dilute the message. And then they're sending out this tiny weak message. They think it's powerful, but for the purposes of, of just donor attraction and moving people to get them in that first step, it just doesn't work. So remember, you can still be working on your message at this point. Uh, you can still be proving your case and refining your script and all that's fine. But if you're still in that phase of optimizing, refining, proving their case, use the organic methods, the free methods of attraction here uh, that we're about to go over to refine your message so that you know it's working before you move on to using paid methods and spending money. Okay, so what are our organic attraction methods? These are free or low-cost ways to get your first donors quickly. Other advantages is that they're easy to understand, you don't necessarily need to be tech savvy to use them, and they're easy to implement quickly. 
the disadvantages of using organic methods is, you know, while they're quick and easy, they do require some ongoing manual labor on your part. And as you grow, you want to scale. And these methods will become more burdensome as you scale up your fundraising program. Okay, organic methods are perfect when you're starting a nonprofit, uh, even just a new program, or maybe you're rebooting a program. Um, say you're walking into a nonprofit, even if it's old and it's been around a while. Use these free and low cost methods to test things out. You know, use them to kick the tires a bit, you know, and diagnose a problem. Uh, but especially, you know, with this program, Fundraising Clarity, use these methods first if you're still establishing your proof of case in any other messages. And here are the five organic attraction methods we're going to go over here. These are what we use in Fundraising Clarity. First are organic Facebook posts. And you can say social media in general, but really, you start spreading yourself thin when you, when, when you do that. Uh, you start complicating things, and then you start draining your time, and this is when you become frazzled and, and time is sucked away from you. Because the more social media platforms you add, the busier you are, and your focus is taken away. Here we're going to use the most omnipresent platform you uh, have out there, and you're going to use your page to solicit a response to get your donors on the call. Two is direct outreach. Here we're talking about sending a personal message to someone with a simple message to spark a conversation. And, and when it does, you get them on the phone right away using your conversion script. Number three is uh, time-tested and, and underutilized. This is free events, things like house parties, open houses. If you're a new nonprofit and you're a founder especially, then you need to already be doing these. You know, using your new proof of case as the centerpiece. Um, house parties. These are great ways to do what many people are already out there doing naturally anyway. And that's, you know, having people over, you know, for small bites and drinks, may, maybe some form of entertainment. Then you gather everyone around for a brief but powerful presentation, which is your case. It's no pressure just information you're providing and then you'll be surprised that when every time you do that there's a few people who step forward there's your three percent and they want to get more deeply engaged with you something you said sparked with them we'll talk more about this method of course um, and really all of your board members should be doing these house parties things like house parties fourth is list farming um, really, this is bulk email or an email blast, you know, verbiage changes. Most lists um, will have this contact information, you know, email address. You know, generally speaking, this is not effective. But uh, if you're an organization that has some old lists or perhaps you've inherited a CRM database or, you know, old list of donors from a long time ago or something, you'll want to definitely farm this list by bulk emailing them using your message to solicit a response. You've already got good prospects there. Um, and some other landmines, but we'll go over that. You'll email everyone and you'll you'll get them on a webinar or get them on a call, you know, to reignite these people. And then the last thing here is going on a joint venture. And this can be with another nonprofit. This could be with a business that you're you can align with, you know, if the fit's right and your missions don't uh, conflict. But basically what you're doing here is you're partnering with someone who shares your values uh, and you are able to access their customers or even employees if they're a large company. It's a great way to get new donors. And some of these will work better than others if you're an older nonprofit. Um, really, there are pros and cons to being new or old here, and we'll get into that a little more in the next videos. Okay, now let's discuss paid attraction methods. Unlike our counterparts in the for-profit sector, we in the nonprofit sector need to be careful when paying for things to attract new donors. You know, go back to week one and recall how uh, we are required to balance opulence with parsimony. 
you know, remember my example about the full color envelopes that I used at a child welfare organization? We were unfairly judged on how nice they were. And even though they cost nothing, we were unfairly judged on how nice they were, <laughs> uh, even though they were the lowest cost for us at the time. It's a lesson I learned. What some people just don't understand, but you will, is that some investment can have compound interest for us. Think about having a vending machine in your office, and you walk up and you put in a dollar. Then two dollars comes out. <laughs> and that's the vending machine. You know, when done right, you can set up paid ads this way, actually. And, uh, you know, there's a diminishing returns, but you can have a high degree of certainty what that is, and you'll say, okay, well, it's time to put some money into this thing so we can get twice as much out. When you have things set up right, your message and everything, that's just about how predictable things can be when you get the hang of this fundraising thing. So, other advantages to paid attraction methods is that they're scalable and automated. Once you're set up, it's working for you 24-7. Thinking of nature, uh, continuing in that line of, of thinking, think of a scarecrow and crows. A very basic stimulus to scare off crows that protects a farmer's corn. So rather than paying someone to go out there and scare the crows away, or the farmer doing it himself, uh, you just put up the scarecrow and it saves the farmer lots of manual work. Okay, that's basically what we're doing here with Facebook ads this week. Um, those are both scalable and automated. Disadvantages are that setting these methods up does require technology know-how and time, and of course they cost money. Uh, you can pay someone to do it for you, but of course that costs money to get someone who knows what they're doing um, so just don't go off and invest good money and time in these without an optimized message use organic methods to test your message first uh, here are paid donor attraction methods we're going to learn to set up paid ads to our prospect pool and we're going to use Facebook's advertising platform we'll create an ad with text and an image We'll place it in front of our prospect pool as the stimulus, and the 3% we're attracting will let us know they're interested in engaging with us. Two, we're going to learn about retargeting our ads. Now, doing this, we're more advanced than 99% of all nonprofits out there. We're going to set up paid ads to place in front of people who have already clicked our ads. <laughs> uh, they've already landed on our landing page and they've spent some time checking us out already. If they went that far and they didn't choose to engage with us, we're going to get in front of them again. And it's worth our time and effort and money. Three, direct mail. It's not automated and it's barely scalable, really. But I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about its pros and cons and why you might want to include it in a fundraising program you know at some point and you'll be able to also make a decision if it's worth your time after you go through this um, when you already have an online process that's working for you you might choose not to do it and this last piece the donor funnel it's part of the process again go back to our methodology uh, this is where we actually apply that concept of natural selection to identify the 3% most likely to donate right now. So people who come through this funnel part of the way, they're still going to be there for you to follow up with. We're going to capture their, their contact information right at the offset, and they're solid donor prospects. But those who pass through all the way through the funnel are clearly engaged, <laughs> and they're ready to talk. This is fantastic. Okay, so thanks for joining me in this video, and I'll see you in the next one right away.